Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If you follow spaceflight, you might well have watched the Dragon spacecraft rendezvous and dock with the International Space Station. Watching them approach from below and behind the station, pass underneath and then circulate up and around to the front of the station before approaching the docking port. Similarly, when the Dragon spacecraft leaves, they will back away and fly over the top of the station until they're a safe distance away. These kind of maneuvers are known as proximity operations and there's a lot of things to know about how to perform them correctly to take advantage of the way that spacecraft move around in orbit. But these kind of proximity operations are also important to military operations in space where adversaries are moving spacecraft like inspection satellites or electronic intelligence satellites in close proximity to targets. And we have seen various animations released showing the interactions seen in recent years in orbit. Recent news articles have talked of spacecraft dogfighting in space as adversaries maneuver around each other trying to gain an advantage. And this is not like Star Wars where the spaceships move like fast like aircraft and battles last for a minute until one is destroyed. There's no weapons involved at this time. There's very likely intelligence gathering operations. Those are what's driving this. These encounters in orbit, they play out over days and the maneuvers are subtle nudges into the orbit that result in what look like well, delicate space ballet, except one of the superpowers are quietly challenging the other one. For example, back in 2022, a satellite named USA-270 approached two Chinese uh, experimental satellites, Xi'an-1201 and Xi'an-1202. Uh, these were slowly drifting westwards through the geostationary orbit. Uh, the US spacecraft began approaching them to take a look at them, and as it got close, the spacecraft split apart and took different routes, placing Xi'an-1202 behind USA-270 and hiding in the glare of the sun during closest approach. This encounter was tracked and analysed by a company called Comspock, which makes software for space situational awareness, and their site has a number of animations that show similar encounters in space. It's not always easy to understand these animations, even knowing how unintuitive orbital mechanics can be for us that live on the surface. A generation of Kerbal Space Program players have intuitively learned orbital mechanics. Even if they don't know the correct names for the six orbital elements, they can look at an orbit and imagine a spacecraft following this ellipse, remaining in the plane of following Keplerian orbits, driven by the laws of physics. It's less intuitive, but to a first approximation, there are also relatively simple laws of motion for spacecraft that are moving close together in proximity operations, whether cooperatively or otherwise. We can take, say, the space station as our reference point and watch how spacecraft move in relation to this. And this results in an entirely different set of equations and elliptical orbits from the point of view of the space station or whatever target that we're following. These are spacecraft on almost identical orbits, with one target being on a circular orbit, or at least close enough to a circular orbit that we can use a common reference frame of a perfectly circular orbit, and then just look at how the other spacecraft move relative to this orbit. And it turns out that for small differences, the spacecraft also follow ellipses. The exact motions are described by the Cloese-Wiltshire equations, which were derived in the 1960s at NASA, and I'm sure they're pretty easy to work with. We're not going to be going into that first. I just want to give you an intuitive understanding of how spacecraft move when they are dancing around each other in orbit. But before you start planning satellite orbits to investigate your adversaries, it's time to consider your vulnerability to inspections with the help of this video's sponsor, Incogni, a service that helps you keep your data private, hiding it away from investigation, not through fancy orbital maneuvering, but by legal maneuvers. So the deal is that there are companies whose entire business model is collecting data on people like you and then selling this to, well, anyone that wants to buy it. And the truth is, there's not much incentive for these data brokers to make sure that the people buying your data have your interests at heart. This data is collected and compiled from many sources, like public records, social media, and sometimes through data leaks, either through malice or incompetence. Sure, I know a lot of you are thinking that this stuff is just used to send you more spam, which obviously sucks. 
But that is just the tip of the data broker iceberg. We've seen this data used to target people for scams, using AI voices that impersonate relatives to solicit money from them. This is a story that would have sounded like sci-fi a few years ago. Who knows what threats the future might bring? In The Terminator, the time-traveling cyborg uses an old-fashioned phone book to get home addresses, but I guess nowadays it would just roll up to a data broker with a credit card, presumably after putting some clothes on. There are laws that can protect you and require data to be taken down if you ask, but there are so many companies that it's much easier to have a service like Incogni handle the process across their list of 230 data brokers. Once you sign up and give them your details, they will start working for you, identifying matching records around the internet and requesting the takedowns. And on an ongoing basis, they will continue to guard your privacy, sending new takedown requests as more data appears in the wild. Instead of having to phone hundreds of providers yourself, you can just follow the progress on their UI, which shows you how many requests have been sent, how many are cleared, and how many are still being worked on. It is a much better use of your time or your families because they do offer a family plan that covers up to four additional members under one account. Take back your personal data with Incogni. Use code MANLY at the link in the description to get 60% off the annual plan. So, to visualize this motion, what we do is we take our target our orbit, have the camera follow that ideal circular orbit, and then we rotate it so that as it moves around the Earth, the Earth is always down and you imagine, say, that it's moving to the right. So if the target spacecraft is on a perfectly circular orbit. You can put it at the center and it will sit there unmoving, right? And if you know orbital mechanics, you'll know that something in a circular orbit with a different radius will have to move at a different speed and also travel a different distance. So you can imagine that an object that is, say, towards the top of the screen in a higher orbit will move to the left getting behind the target. And when an object is below the center, middle of the screen, it will start to move to the right, getting ahead of the target. So how fast is this motion, right? How, what does this actually work out to? Well, there's actually two components. First of all, there's a the circumference. As you're on the inside, you're going a shorter distance. On the outside, you're going a further distance. And that factor is two pi r, right? We know that it's the difference. It's a simple, like a circumference, right? So if you change the altitude by one meter, then you need to travel two pi meters different depending upon whether you're going up or down. Now, there's also a speed difference, and it turns out that speed difference accounts for another factor of pi r. So what this says is that for every orbit you travel, you will gain or lose three pi r, where r is the difference between an altitude. So for example, if you're one kilometer below the target, you will catch up by 9.425 kilometers every orbit. Or for another approximation, in low Earth orbit, it takes 90 minutes. So you can just divide your altitude difference by 10, and that gets you a pretty good approximation of the closure or departure rate. So if you're one kilometer below the target, you're gonna be catching up at 100 meters per minute. And that's a pretty good estimate if you don't happen to have a computer on hand. In real numbers, 100 meters, it works out to about like 1.75 meters per second or 6.2 kilometers per hour. So that's a constant drift between targets. And you can imagine how an inspector satellite might swing by the target that it's trying to investigate by going into higher or lower orbit. So now, what happens if you make that orbit elliptical by increasing the eccentricity a very small amount? Well, Kepler's equations tell us that the distance from the Earth changes between perigee and apogee, and the distance is proportional to the eccentricity. When it's closer to the planet, it moves slightly faster. When it's further away, it moves slightly slower. So when you project this into our special coordinate frame, it actually makes an ellipse, with the horizontal dimension right along the orbit being twice the vertical dimension, right? And it'll move around this ellipse once in orbit. So it's like an orbit within an orbit. So if the chasing satellite has exactly the same orbital period as the target, then it can describe an ellipse which basically stays still in our coordinates. If you set it up right, you can actually have that orbit around the origin about the target. But if the period is different because it's higher or lower, then the center of that ellipse will move either ahead or behind, tracing out a path which is a bit like a cycloid, but because it's an ellipse rather than a circle, it's kind of a squished cycloid. So how fast does the spacecraft move around this ellipse? 
Well, that's simple. Again, we know that it completes one revolution in every orbit, and each axis is following a simple like harmonic oscillator. If the spacecraft is changing altitude by plus or minus distance d, then at the top and the bottom, it's moving at 4 pi d per orbital period, and at the front and the back points, it's moving radially at 2 pi d per orbit. So real world numbers for a 90 minute orbit with a uh, plus or minus one kilometer ellipse, the spacecraft is orbiting between 1.16 and 2.33 meters per second or about four to eight kilometers per hour, depending upon where you are in the ellipse. I mean, the hardest part here is just dividing by the duration of the orbit, right? The 5,400 seconds or 90 minutes. And of course, the flip side of this is that if you know where you want to go, you can plot an ellipse in this space and then figure out the velocity you need to apply, right? The acceleration that's needed. So for example, if you're sitting two kilometers in front of this target and you want to orbit it, you can thrust radially with a delta V of like 1.16 meters per second. And that will put you on this like one kilometer, you know, four kilometer long ellipse that will travel around the station. So all of this is super academic maybe, <laughs> but I decided to write up uh, a simulation so that you can actually play around with this. So let's go and take a look at that. Okay, so this is my really simple simulation of proximity operations. This is done uh, entirely in HTML. It's on uh, uh, my GitHub. Uh, <laughs> there's no libraries or anything. It's pure JavaScript. And what you can do is you can rotate your spacecraft using the A and uh, D keys, and you can thrust using the W key. Super simple. So now I am on a lower orbit. So this is higher orbits are at the top, lower orbits at the bottom. The space station is moving to the right. This is the space station in the center. The only goal of this is to get to the space station, get stay within 10 units of distance, and hold there for long enough to show that you actually know what you're doing. So one thing I might do, for example, is point straight up and then fire the engines a bit. Now, what's that done? That has increased the eccentricity of this orbit. Now, as it does that, as it does that, I start to go outwards. And because I go outwards, I slow down, right? This The orbit slows as you get to higher altitudes, but it then begins to fall back down and it's going to actually accelerate faster to the, the right here. So the actual average velocity of this hasn't changed, but we now have this cycloid style looping going on. That's because we've got an ellipse which is projected over the average motion to the right here. So what else could we do? Well, we could point towards the target and try hitting it. That might take some time. <laughs> Because what's going to happen is if we fire our engines towards it, we are now moving slower than the space station and we're going to fall down again and we're going to find ourselves again going backwards. That's not great. What, what we're doing is we're basically taking the equations of motion and instead of the classic uh, Newtonian update, this is an update in a rotating space with the gravitational changes. So you can see I'm headed off to the right here will probably fall down and I'm not sure if we'll come back. But you can see how just even adding very small changes can push you way off the map in the wrong direction, which can be <laughs> sort of problematic. Okay, so now remember those speeds that we talked about? Remember how I said that uh, this speed here is going to be like 3 pi times the delta. So it turns out that if we add one third of this velocity here, it will put us into an ellipse which goes exactly the same height above and below. So I need to find, get my thing pointed exactly on heading 90, and then I need to get my velocity to 20, which can be hard because there's no reverse here. But if I do it right, we should be able to go into something approximating an orbit around the station if we wait until we're in the right position. <laughs> and there we go, 20, right? So if I've done my math right, this should be pretty much in an ellipse which goes around the station. There might be a bit of drift. I'm not sure how accurate the velocity change is here, but uh, you should be able to see something approximating this elliptical orbit where it is twice as long in one direction as it is in the other direction, right? And again, this is because of the way that you work on the equations of motion, which are 
for this special rotating frame, this proximity operations frame. There we go. Yeah, we're creating this orbit around this station here. Isn't that beautiful? It may not be perfect. Once we come around, we might find that we're drifting left or right here. Uh, but you can imagine that a spacecraft such as the Dragon coming along here and then getting underneath the space station, it can then fire its engines and rise up. And once here, it can stop its position and then ride in this approach towards the station itself. Yeah, it looks like I've actually managed to pretty much put it into one of these perfectly circular orbits. Brilliant. Oh, I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I'm proud of how accurately that thing worked. Okay, so now, how about we look at the third dimension? That's actually the easiest one, because if the spacecraft isn't in the target plane, right, it will have to oscillate back and forth every orbit, moving basically across that orbit, moving like a sine wave over time. So again, how fast is this going? Well, that's another simple factor of pi. If your outer plane oscillation is at a distance d, then the outer plane crossing speed is 2 pi d divided by the orbital period. So if you have a 1 kilometer oscillation, the outer plane speed will have to be 1.16 meters per second or about 2 kilometers per hour for a 90 minute orbit. So now, remember that simple elliptical orbit that we set up, and I pointed out that the ellipse is longer in one axis than the other. So during the orbit, that means the distance to the target has to change. Imagine you have a scenario where you wanted the distance to the target to be exactly the same during this entire orbit. Say because you're setting up a constellation of spacecraft that are actually measuring the distances between each other for science. Well, what you can do is you can add an out-of-plane component so that the distance is actually kept constant. And so just imagine that you have a little triangle that says that the hypotenuse has to be length two, and you know that one side of the triangle has to be length one. By simple math, that means the other side has to be length of root three to make the Pythagoras equation works. Or to put it in terms of angles, the circle or circular orbit is at an angle of 60 degrees to the plane. Now notice I didn't say inclination because inclination is very specifically the term for the angle in the Keplerian orbit around the central body. To convert this into an inclination, it works out that uh, you, the sine of the inclination is equal to the square root of three multiplied by the eccentricity of the orbit. It's actually, again, a really simple mathematical relationship that comes out of this geometry. And so if you apply this, then you can actually get beautifully fixed geometry constellations of spacecraft orbiting a planet or the sun. Uh, you just need to vary like the angles of the planes and everything so that they all hold this orientation. And this is, of course, the trick that is used by Europe's Laser Interferometer Space Antenna Mission, which is going to put three gravitational wave telescopes out into a solar orbit so that they can measure a new type of gravitational waves that have never been seen before. It's really wonderfully elegant and there's no limit to the number of objects you can put into this kind of two-dimensional formation. You just have to get them all there into the correct orbit. So while a lot of you may have experienced these behaviors in Kerbal Space Program, the truth is we're usually moving too quickly in that game to have to worry about them. If you go fast, then the unintuitive curving motions can be ignored. But that takes more fuel to do that. And if you're trying to go slow, well, that's when you find yourself drifting off your straight line course and you need to correct for this. That also takes more fuel. To perform these proximity operations efficiently, you need to understand the behaviors and plan your maneuvers, knowing exactly where they will take your spacecraft to. And of course, these equations are only approximations for nearly circular orbits. If the, if the changes start getting bigger, then you need to add more terms, more corrections, and that's even before you start dealing with real world effects like radiation pressure, atmospheric drag, non-spherical gravity, and possibly a non-cooperative adversary, which is reacting to your maneuvers in real time and trying to ruin your day. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.